Hello and welcome to this Hawk Hydramit presentation on the Wet Labs Water Quality Monitor, known simply as the WQM. I'm Nick Randall with Hawk Hydramit, and presenting on the WQM today is Ian Walsh, Senior Oceanographer and Vice President of Marketing and Sales at Wet Labs. Throughout our 15-minute presentation, we will introduce Wet Labs as a company, provide an overview of the WQM and the parameters it measures, cover the, the WQM's extensive anti-fouling systems in detail, and also review several case studies. I'll now give a brief overview of Wet Labs as a company. Wet Labs was founded in 1992 in Philomath, Oregon. Its technological emphasis is on optical water quality sensors for coastal and freshwater deployment, and it currently sells six families of sensor and system products. Wet Labs joined Statlantic and Seabird Electronics in the Seabird Ocean Group, part of Hawk's Environmental Water Division. The Seabird Ocean Group combines the technology and research efforts of these three industry-leading companies into one unified effort. Ian is now going to pr provide an introduction of the WQM. Thanks, Nick. The WQM was, is a joint project between Seabird and Wet Labs. Uh, Seabird Electronics is up in uh, Bellevue, Washington, and is well known for their CTD DO sensors that have been used in oceanographic research for many years. Wet Labs is, a, as Nick said, an optics company primarily, and the impetus between to, for bringing the WQM to market was to put together our, our best efforts to get an instrument that lasts for a long time in a long-term monitoring uh, methodology. As we said, we developed it cooperatively between the two companies. We focused on integrating the design of the instrumentation of each of the sensors to come to a much cleaner package, simplified control electronics. By bringing it into an integrated package, we'd have fewer failure points within the entire system, and then wrap it all up with uh, as many biofouling protection technologies as we could muster. The WQM employs the Seabird CTD DO sensor and the Wet Labs FLNTU sensor. The FLNTU is a combined chlorophyll and backscattering or turbidity sensor, and the Seabird C and both those sensors have been used in or are being used in thousands of applications around the world. As I said, the WQM was designed specifically for long-term deployment in biologically active waters, uh, both coastal and inland waters, and can typically be deployed for a minimum of three months in almost any environment. The parameters of the WQM that are measured are temperature, salinity, depth, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll fluorescence, turbidity and or backscattering, and we also have an auxiliary port option that's a, that you can add on to a blue-green algae fluorometer, a photosynthetic available radiation PAR sensor, a color dissolved organic matter fluorometer, or a pH sensor. One note on the pH sensor is that we have not yet found a technology uh, for measuring pH that's stable in uh, water for the long term. So, so the, while we can provide a pH sensor, it doesn't have the stability, the inherent stability of the sensors of the rest of the instrumentation. The WQM, we currently have over 200 instruments out in the, uh, the world being used, and they're being used in all sorts of environments. Essentially, any aquatic environment is suitable for WQM except for extremely shallow waters. Uh, coastal environments are certainly probably the focus of the instrument, uh, very high biofouling, open ocean bays and, and estuaries, and mid-latitudes uh, is uh, certainly one of the harshest uh, biofouling environments. It's also very, been very well used in freshwater lakes and rivers, um, and it, we have some examples of data that we'll show later on and links to live data sets for freshwater environments. As I said earlier, biofouling is probably the most uh, important part of the entire package. Our sensors are, are inherently stable. Calibrations are, are very specific for the analytics that we're measuring. And we don't have, for the, generally, we've solved the problems of, of getting an instrument that would be stable in the aquatic environment. So the real question of me measuring over long periods is to minimize the effects of biofouling on the, on the package itself. And we've done that uh, a number of ways. We'll describe those later. <clears throat> the upshot of 
putting all of this thing, all of this together and designing it into a single package, is that we can is that the instrument then can stay in the water for a long period of time. You're not having to go out and uh, clean and replace every seven to ten days or even thirty days. Uh, if you can go to two to three rotations a year, you decrease your your total um, cost of the instrumentation, the cost of collecting that data, simply by dropping the number of trips that you need to go to out to recover the instrument. Additionally, with when you have some certainty as to when the instrument is going to be uh, available or needs to be replaced, you have certainty of scheduling within the environment, and then you can schedule your year-long year rotations much more easily than having to go out when the instrument suddenly fails due to biofouling. So we've wrapped up a number of systems for biofouling prevention, and that both, includes both active and passive fouling prevention. I'll describe some of the active prevention tools we use right here. First off, with the CTD, the sensors in the CTD are not in the flow fields. So we're using a pumped system that removes the sensors themselves from the ambient flow field and even more importantly, the ambient light field. We start the sample by running the pump, pulling water into the sample and into the sample volume, then it comes past the thermistor through the DO sensor and then back returns out through the uh, salinity sensor. And that inherently um, removes a fair amount of fouling from, the, from those sensor systems. With, on top of that, we have added a bleach injection system in which you, we add bleach directly into the plenum of the DO sensor, and that keeps biofilms from developing on the surface of the oxygen sensor and keeps the oxygen sensor within 5% accuracy over three months or more. The bleach injection system can be set by the user and typically is set to inject after um, every hour or if you're you're going out longer uh, every two hours. And it can run uh, up to a year, depending on your, your uh, schedule. Uh, finally, in terms of the active systems, we have our very effective BioWiper system on the optics end of the system, and that uh, protects the, the backscatter and chlorophyll measurement. That's been very effective on all of our ECOs, and the ECOs have been uh, put around the world from from uh, extremely harsh environments like the Great Barrier Reef to uh, somewhat more benign environments such as the Ross Sea. We also use passive anti-fouling systems. For the most part, that includes copper. Uh, we've covered as much of the instrument with, with copper as uh, we can. That includes the, the Bliss canister and the thermistor and salinity guard and we also have a copper ring along with the copper faceplate uh, protecting the eco on the, the bottom end of the instrument. Anti-fouling cartridges are used on the ingress and egress of the pump system, and that allows that when we're not pumping that the biofouling uh, prevention mechanism diffuses into the volume of the CTD sensors and decreases the, the available um, sites for biofouling within that system. All together, put, put these all together, and we've found that, our users have found that these instruments can reliably go for, for three to six months uh, and up to a year in some uh, relatively benign uh, environments. Generally, we recommend two to three to four uh, switches out of the instrument, depending on your environment. Yeah, annually. I was just going to go quickly into some information that we have uh, from testing of the instrument. A lot of this is available in more depth on our website at uh, weblabs.com on the WQM page, and uh, we will provide a link to that at the end of the of the uh, session. The, during the development of this of the of the WQM, we tested the instrument on a side by side test of a protected instrument versus an unprotected instrument. This was in Yukon Bay, Oregon, about uh, 60 miles uh, west of our location here in Philomath. And this test 
uh, results from this test were written up, and other tests of the instrumentation were written up in a paper that's available uh, in the 2007 MTS IEEE Ocean Proceedings. Uh, that paper and a um, PowerPoint presentation on those results is available on our website. If you notice in the pictures here, so we stripped one of the instruments uh, from from all protections, and as the results speak for themselves, the middle set of pictures are the uh, CTD end and the eco end with no protection. In the middle on the right is the protected uh, unit, and you can see a clean ingress on the CTD with no fouling on the copper and uh, very clean optics on the eco side. And of course, the no protection shows uh, highly fouled. I'll just pick a couple of data points here. The turbidity data, um, as we expected and we've seen in other environments, uh, we're looking here in the top the top figure uh, comparison between the no protected and the the uh, protected in black. The arrow indicates where the two signals start to diverge, and the validation points are from a secondary. Uh, instrument measurement that we dipped at those times. And you can see very clearly uh, that after within about two weeks, you start to see a divergence between the turbidity and the the uh, protected value. And very nicely with turbidity, that typically that the instrument tends to go to saturation. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you know when your biofouling has occurred. Um, one of the problems with biofouling is just to know when your data has degraded so that you're, it's not really reportable. For DO, uh, because again, as, we, as I said earlier, we put the DO um, out of the light field and out of the ambient flow field. We last quite a bit longer, so it's about uh, a month or so before we start to see a differential between the two measurements. And then as um, late June arrived, the oxygen uh, biofilm essentially degrades enough the oxygen signal enough so that the instrument itself records no oxygen in the in the ambient fluid. Uh, quickly run through a Venice Lagoon case study. Uh, the Venice Lagoon is charged with monitoring uh, 13 sites in the lagoon. They use a uh, Adrenaut CTD uh, in a, in continuous operation mode. We loaned them a WQM. They put the WQM in one of their sites, left it there for 100 days, came back and recovered it, and we took a look at the data. Essentially, the data uh, was comparable between the two instruments. The difference was that the uh, people running the system had to go out and replace their their previous system seven times during that 100 days. And each of those rotations was about three people days. So it's a considerable load when you think about three people days over 100 days, and some of those were within a week of each other. So it becomes a very uh, scheduling nightmare. Uh, just quickly run through some of the temperature, some of the data sets here. The temperature between the two instruments was comparable. Uh, that's not too surprising. Uh, Biofouling actually doesn't affect uh, thermistors particularly much. It doesn't change the temperature field, um, but just shows coherence between the two instrumentations. In contrast, the chlorophyll uh, shows a definite change. If you notice by the end of May in the red boxes, which is the uh, the regular system, and the uh, black diamonds is the WQM, by the end of May, the signal in the um, chlorophyll from the standard system has started to degrade and go close to zero. Um, we actually have data. That we've blown this up and looked at individual days, and we see nice diel cycles in the WQM data, which are degraded within the, the chlorophyll data. Uh, as I said before, one of the difficulties is not, to, is not to see the impact of the degradation of by biofouling, and this is you know, clearly in chlorophyll, that's one of the problems, is that you don't get a clear signal that your instrument is actually not, not reporting the correct data. On the freshwater side, I'd suggest that you go to the WQM data set uh, on the WQM site, we've got links to two uh, live data sets. Uh, links are also here. One's in the Columbia River in Oregon, and one is in Lake Okeechobee at the SCCF site. 
Uh, thank you very much for your participation.